all of these problems, they're mechanical, system problems that we're about to go through, they're big. It's bothering me, it's really bothering me because we are literally in the middle of nowhere hundreds and hundreds of miles from any haul out facilities and you know when you live on a boat it can really really take its toll in between boat maintenance in lombok which we'll come on to in a moment we took a break in the uk during the stopover at jakarta the capital of indonesia jamie went walkabout and practiced his favorite low light street photography But on to important boat issues. Do you remember this? If you remember, I was alluding to uh, an issue and uh, that was an issue with this knocking sound that we were getting. As I said earlier, we had a great sail. It's all been good. Uh, we've now just got a motor the last two, three hours against the current. Uh, but this chattering noise in the uh, transmission area is really bothering me. It's a real issue though, because it's not, you can't take it out. Uh, with the boat in the water because you've got to remove the shaft in order to take the whole uh, flexible coupling out. It's bothering me, it's really bothering me because we are literally in the middle of nowhere, hundreds and hundreds of miles from any haul out facilities and uh, we don't even have internet connection and we probably won't have internet connection until we get to the little town on the islands. So um, yeah, I can't even do any research on it. Anyway, just worry about it later. My theory was that there was an issue with uh, the blades on the Max prop. It turns out the prop had nothing to do with the knocking sound. All of these problems, they're mechanical, system problems that we're about to go through, they're big. And you know, when you live on a boat, it can really, really take its toll. At the end, we're going to talk about that in a bit more detail. Let's go on board Esper, where Jamie discusses problems with the flexible coupling, the shaft, the dripless seal, and finally discovers what that knocking sound was. But first, how does Esper smell? The most important thing when you return to your boat after a leave of absence is to make sure that it smells okay. I'm happy to say that Esper is smelling exactly the same as she did the very first day we went to visit her before we bought her. It sounds like an odd thing to suggest, but what you don't want, of course, is the smell of mould. And we're happy to report that uh, there doesn't seem to be any mould here, even though we, we closed everything up. We do know people that have closed up their boat in the tropics in the past, left it for many months, and they've grown back, uh, come back to a very green boat. Obviously, it's a complete mess. Liz did a great job of uh, leaving out various cockroach powders or anti-cockroach powders. Um, everything was decommissioned. Everything was turned off, the electrics, the fridge. Uh, we removed the freezer and uh, really the only thing that we left connected was the automatic bilge pump which sounds a bit odd to do when you're on the hard but don't forget we do have a through hull uh, mast um, and so what this means is, is that we do get some water in the bilges even on the hard if it rains. <laughs> The problem we've got with the shaft is that it goes into the flexible coupling which of course connects eventually to the gearbox which allows for the misalign any misalignment of the shaft to the gearbox. It's not a traditional keyway fitting so normally on the shaft you'd have a key set into it so that it slides into the flexible coupling to stop it from slipping. We don't have that. Uh, we have a clamp system uh, but even so what happens is when you push that shaft into position it can kind of it locks itself in any way and uh, it takes a bit of coaxing to open up that flexible coupling in order to remove the shaft um, every time I've done it in the past uh, it's a two-man job it's not something I've been able to do on my own 
uh, we've used heat guns, metal shims, chisels, any bits of metal to try and open up that flexible coupling uh, to just to allow that movement. Then of course we've got the dripless seal which is attached to that so we have to be careful about any WD-40 that kind of thing if we spray that onto the flexible cup and we've got to be careful that that dripless seal does not get dirty so uh, the job is is it uses brute force on the one hand but we have to be quite delicate on the other hand we want to take this off and give it a clean um, but of course it's got two o-rings inside this is the flexible coupling those two o-rings slide down what is supposed to be a nice smooth shaft but after a couple of years of use you can see there's a little bit of crevice corrosion there uh, there's also as we turn the shaft around a little bit of rust as well so if we try and slide this off uh, this is not going to run true across here and it will rip the o-rings. Now I have spare o-rings uh, but I would still like to give this a good clean first before attempting to take off that collar from the flexible, uh, sorry from the dripless seal. So all I'm doing is just I'm um, taking some sandpaper and literally just giving this a little clean just so it's nice and smooth so that will allow me to loosen this off slide it up a little and then we can start looking at trying to remove the shaft. Further inspection upon the engine mounts shows that one of the mounts has disintegrated. Not completely, but it's falling apart. And uh, we think it's probably diesel that has disintegrated the rubber. Fortunately, I had the foresight to pick up some more when I went back to the UK. So it is this rubber shoe here, just there, which has pretty much uh, rotten away. This would explain a lot actually because it's on the starboard side and it was the starboard side of the engine which appeared to be vibrating more than anywhere else. I knew this because we have two vertical stainless supports that hold up the cockpit and it was the one on the starboard side that was vibrating a lot more than the one on the port side. So we've been in touch with Hendro who's the local mechanic here. He's going to be turning our new shaft uh, but he said before we put the new shaft in, of course, we need to put the new mounts on first. Hendro propped up the engine from underneath to keep it roughly in position and then tackled each mount in turn. If you have to replace one mount, it's advisable to replace the mount on the opposite side as well, so as to keep the engine balanced. But ideally, if you replace one, you should replace them all, which is what Hendro did. It was fairly straightforward for Hendro at least, though the forward port mount was particularly troublesome due to difficult access. Fortunately, Hendro has the patience of a saint. The other thing he looked at while he was here was our flexible coupling and you notice that there is quite a bit of play in it. That is when you turn the shaft in between the two ends of the flexible coupling uh, it was moving more than it should do before it gave some resistance. This is most likely the bearings inside which have worn I should think or maybe need greasing. If you remember I attempted to do this in the vlog earlier, I don't know if I actually included it in the end. That is something that uh, needs to come out completely and taken to a workshop, so uh, we're going to try and take that out as well. Because this went to a workshop, there isn't much we can show you, but Hendro was able to source new bearings and fix our coupling. The other job completed off-site was the turning of a new shaft. A major problem we've been having for a while was insufficient charge from our Victron inverter charger. It had driven us mad, and this is what Jamie had to say about it. 
My theory is, is that the internal cooling fan has stopped working, which might explain why it's not charging at a full rate. Uh, it's only charging uh, at a top rate for a couple of minutes and then it sort of cuts down its output. So I suspect it might be something through the fan. I'm hoping that's what the problem is because that should be a straightforward fix. Initially we thought it was a problem with the generator. If you remember when we were in Bitten we actually got uh, the generator taken not only to the dive school uh, but also we took it into Monado and they said that there wasn't anything wrong with it but we kept seeing when trying to charge the batteries that uh, it kept dropping charge. Anyway we're now here obviously in the boatyard and it's doing the same thing on shore power. We've been looking at as many of the circuits that we can uh, looking to see if there's any corrosion or resistance in the cables and uh, everything seems to be all right so i've had to get in touch with paul of octopus asia who are based in phuket who installed the uh, original victron and lithium system and he is able to gain remote access to the whole system which is what i'm doing now on the computer i'm waiting for him to uh, get back to me uh, after after he's had a look at it because uh, it's really puzzling. We just can't work out why it is doing this. And I just wonder if there's perhaps a setting within the software of the inverter that is restricting that charge. So, uh, yeah, we'll wait to hear back from him. Paul came back saying there were no issues with the settings. So, Jamie returned to his original theory. Well, as I suspected, there is a problem with the fan. This goes back to my theory of this uh, shutout when the inverter unit gets too hot. Um, this tends to happen when it's charging, not inverting. Obviously it tends to be putting more in than taking out, if you see what I mean. So uh, we just had a look at the fan when we uh, ran the induction cooker and uh, we noticed the fan was struggling. It was sort of starting and stopping, not spinning correctly. So we're now going to try and swap the fan out. Okay, so Felsen has taken off the fan only to discover it is 24 volt, not 12 volt. Of course it is. Uh, fortunately these guys have said that they should be able to find a fan somewhere on the island, so fingers crossed. Well there we have it. It wasn't the propeller after all, as outlined in the previous episode, but it was in fact not one, but two broken engine mounts. That was what was causing the vibration. And on top of that, we had issues with the flexible coupling, which I kind of suspected, but didn't really have much evidence of. As you can see, boat problems can become stressful, especially when you're in a situation where you can't deal with it, i.e. in the water and away from facilities. And as Liz said at the beginning of the episode, this can cause stress and uh, it, it can make you feel quite uncomfortable. If you've been following our podcasts, which we're now putting out every other Sunday, you'll know that we talked about this subject very recently. We talked about stress and anxiety. And as you can see from this episode, it was these problems with the boat that was causing me my own anxiety. And hopefully by now you would have seen our latest podcast in which we discuss being out of control, not having any control of these situations. So uh, if you like these subjects, then don't forget to tune in, catch our episodes one Sunday and uh, catch the, the uh, analysis, the podcast, where we delve into these subjects a little bit more deeply on the other Sunday. We were about to record <laughs> an ending for the video that you're <laughs> editing at the moment. But there's a whiteout over there and I just said to you, I'm not going back in the boat, in the, to the boat in the dinghy in this because I don't want to get all wet. And you said, come on. That was about 10 minutes ago. So if we'd gone, we probably would have made it. And now we're stuck here till the rain goes. There you go.